Okay, I guess it's going to be like this. It's better than nothing. Uh, oh, it's on full screen? Okay. It's not full screen, yeah. Uh, let you deal with how to put it full screen. I don't. I, full screen only is at the level. Yeah, well, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Exactly, that's what I meant. <laughs> uh, we can spend five minutes trying to find it. So, can I just go down the slides with the arrow, arrows, like here on the keyboard? or? Yeah, just like this. Okay. So. I just started the live stream. Does that mean okay. everybody can hear you? <laughs> Try it. Just like this. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry about all that problem. Yeah, no worries. Sorry, everybody, for all that technical problems. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Can I start? Yeah. Oh, okay. So thanks everyone for waiting. I'm really sorry for the technical issues. Uh, my name is Eric Volstedt. I'm a BitNation's lead ambassador, and I came here to introduce BitNation to you. Maybe some of you heard about it before, and for those who didn't, I want to give you like a short introduction, and then I want to go into a discussion round because I think there's going to be lots of issues that you might want to ask or have doubts, doubts about. So, <clears throat> um, first of all, um, yeah, I want to tell you a bit about my background, why I got involved in BitNation and why I think this is something that can be of, yeah, uh, of use for the um, So, I have an anarchist background and I want to change things, let's say, in society, but it does not tell anything about BitNation's values. It's literally for anyone, tools to basically uh, try out new things and experiment with ideas. Um, so why I'm in this is because I realized that if you try to change things from inside the system, um, you will probably not get far because you spend years and years of your life trying to make yourself hurt and trying to get people to agree with you, but instead you could just start building a new model that makes the old one obsolete. So, like I um, point out in this meme here, um, you could just write code that explodes the paradigm instead of waiting for others to give you permission. You could just go ahead and yeah, build something that is better than the existing system. So, the essential question with BitNation is, um, would you like to choose your governance services just the same way you choose your phone? Um, because we all happen to be born in different countries, we face big obstacles when trying to access different governance services. We, we just, you just happen in France, in Bangladesh, in Uruguay, wherever. Um, and in order to um, take advantage of a different governance system, you need to leave behind everything. You need to move physically to this other country. You need to learn a new language, you need to leave behind your friends, your family, your culture, and everything just because you didn't like, uh, like a particular set of services. So, uh, on the other hand, also you're forced to consume their services. You're forced to pay these taxes, you're forced to accept this health insurance, and so on and so on. And um, if you want to try out something new, you have to agree, let's say, with a set that is already being offered by a different geographical territory. So, uh, what does this mean? Um, Basically, one of our ambassadors, Tetsuishi, he said, the blockchain is not just for money. It's there for brand new governance structures replacing the nation-state concept from the Napoleon era. Digital nomads like me know that national borders are imaginary. Our activities are global, but most governance systems are still for locals only. So he himself is a digital nomad, and he sees that basically the way the governance models or the, the, this one-size-fits-all service is structured, is very uh, antique, it's like from, yeah, from the Treaty of Westphalia from more than 200 years ago. And um, so digital nomads already um, transcend these borders and um, they could even use, yeah, d services that are completely different from what we have today. Um, but apart from that, 
also points out the government marriage system is one of the most obsolete systems today. Marriage is a very personal matter, but it's being enforced by governments and the laws are so different in each country. So for example, with marriage, you're uh, forced to abide with the law set that is in the country, but um, maybe you um, are in an international marriage or something that, is, that completely transcends national um, like geographic territories. So uh, wouldn't it be better to have uh, diff the, the, all of these services organized in a way that transcends border, that is borderless? So um, basically we live in, uh, yeah, in the nation state paradigm, which means we have a global oligo uh, oligopoly. So um, everywhere you go, you have um, a geographic monopoly provider of governance services, and you have no competition in these specific territories. So this leads to basically war, injustice, corruption, tax, so local uh, monopolies fight for power and for expanding their borders. And um, further, these uh, governance providers have no incentive to improve their services because they're monopoly providers. So like we learn in school actually that all monopolies are bad, but when it comes to the government, of course it's not bad because yeah, you need their uh, legal stability. The fact that there's no competition doesn't give them any incentive to improve their services and they can even racketeer people through taxes. Um, one of our other ambassadors, Pedro Rivera, he uh, pointed out, um, I want to create tools that people can use to manage themselves as a society. The conventional law-based system is very weak for the society we live in nowadays. People with enough money or intelligence can manipulate and use it against society, as we have seen many times. So Pedro Rivera, he is from Colombia, and uh, there you can see that politics is more of a popularity contest, not about actual contents or about, yeah, change, let's say. And um, instead of waiting for politics to change something, he also just wants to create tools that you can use at in any point in time, and you can just opt out immediately without waiting for years for another election. So what we do with Pangea, well, basically BitNation is the organization and what we offer is Pangea. It's a software, it's an app um, that you can use to create binding peer-to-peer -peer smart contracts uh, through a mobile chat interface. So um, further, you can use these um, also for um, resolving disputes because when you set up agreements, you also need to choose an arbitrator who will be responsible. And all of this will be independent from your local um, nation-state jurisdiction. You can design and customize your own laws that are independent from uh, the country that you live in. Uh, further, you can create and join virtual nations. And um, you shouldn't think of the whole package of a nation like we have today, including education, defense, and so forth. But it's more like offering individual governance services and like uh, having like different nations specialized in uh, particular things. So um, further, um, you already have uh, most of the cell phone users of the world in the developing world, 60% of them. And um, people are also, also mostly using WeChat, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and so on. And the gigantic global legal services market of more than uh, $600 billion per year. So um, why did we choose to have a chat interface for all of this? Because we realized that most people in developing countries are already doing their businesses through uh, chats anyways. Like they're not going through platforms, they're not like writing everything on paper. They just make uh, very informal agreements and uh, they don't need to have like all this yeah, uh, work around with notaries and so on. So we decided to just give them a very intuitive interface through a, yeah, through a chat application where you can just from the conversation go right over into the, uh, into the smart contract templates and make a formal agreement. But uh, that will be on the blockchain and not uh, through your local, uh, like local jurisdiction. Um, also, really important to operate in these uh, kind of places is that the, um, the whole thing is based on a mesh network called Pantalasa. Pantalasa was the ocean around the supercontinent Pangea. Um, Pantalasa uh, is built in a way that is not only decentralized, allows you to communicate in a highly encrypted way, but also works offline. It's a sneaker net that can be accessed through relays or Bluetooth or cables or anything. 
So uh, people in the developing world who have no access to the internet could also make use of Pangea to make agreements and uh, to get yeah this legal security that they didn't have before because they were yeah doing business in uh, let's say black black market style. Um, Further, um, there's more than 2 billion unbanked adults in the world who are completely excluded from our financial markets here in the, in the industrialized world. And um, yeah, so there, there's a huge uh, demand and need for these kind of services where people can uh, start to make agreements and start to make um, loans and um, like these kind of uh, financial services that are impossible for them because they are uh, undocumented. And um, if you would take all of this uh, economy of unbanked um, adults, it would be the second biggest economy in the world after the US. And uh, furthermore, we also have a big imposition in this world, which is the visa system. Uh, people oftentimes have bad passports. Imagine you're born in Bangladesh and you want to work and live in France. It will be rather hard because of all the uh, yeah, legal uh, structure that is in, in yeah in all of the world with the visa system, so um, you you have both of these problems: the lack of financial services and the visa problem. And um, then we we decide to offer uh, passports. So basically, people should be able to have a world citizenship which is completely independent from the place where they happen. This is very arbitrary. So one of our ambassadors, Christoph Feuermann, said. Passports are by no means necessary. Unfortunately, the global apartheid condemns millions of people to stay in their impoverished home countries. My hopes rest in the BitNation platform, which possibly provides everyone in the world with a unique ID on the blockchain, which could be recognized as official travel document by governments. So, um, of course, right now uh, we have the standard of having na national passports, but maybe one day we could have uh, passports that are not physical but that are digital that you can also not lose anymore because they are stored on the blockchain and um, it would be an international standard that wouldn't need any like bureaucracy or anything else anymore um, and here's one example of what this kind of passport could look like uh, this was our pilot in 2014 so um, you just need the QR code and people at the border could check the QR code you uh, have the stamp you uh, have an expiration date and um, yeah in this case it's done through photos so it's here it's a bit um, with uh, biometrics but actually uh, we are looking for ways to do the um, passport without biometrics because we think this is very dangerous uh, because biometrics on the blockchain like Suzanne like our founder of lead to the next uh, genocide because you could filter out people just based on, on this uh, big or gigantic biometric database. Um, so when you have these kind of um, not only passports but also other documents, uh, you could have um, birth certificates, childcare contracts, land titles, and many more. Uh, these will be stored on the blockchain, where you have um, the complete transparency. Everyone can see it, and it's also uh, secured at all times because it's stored in not only one server, but it's let's say decentralized all over the world in many nodes. And you can always prove uh, your ownership of these uh, certificates or of these documents. Um, so another one of our ambassadors in Ghana, he said, most of the properties in my, countries have no, in my country have no title because of cumbersome process and corruption. A decentralized land administration accessible to everyone is what is needed. And the blockchain offers that very cheap. Sooner or later, the state is going to become obsolete. So specifically in Ghana, um, the government is poorly administering um, land, title proper, uh, land titles, basically. So farmers and people who own land cannot use their land to monetize it or to even prove that they own land. So there's lots of local conflict because um, they don't know who owns what and it's more like um, settled informally in, in villages and other local communities. And um, instead, they could have a legal claim to back up to their, their saying that they own this land and they could actually register their land on the blockchain um, and they could use that also for example to access uh, loans to use it as collateral or to even um, make build buildings on it and use it to monetize the land um, so yeah there's lots of local uh, problems that can be solved through blockchain um, and further bitnation has more than yeah i think nowadays 
thousand BitNation citizens that registered on the website. This is very uh, intermediary and formal, and it's just to see, let's say, the demand and where people come from nowadays. Um, but all of this will be moved to the app, to the Pangea app. Uh, we had more than 2,000 open source contributors and more than 100,000 lines of code. And um, we have more than 200 embassies and consulates in the world. So what are embassies? Um, BitNation citizens can offer their personal workspace or even living space to other BitNation citizens and just uh, collaborate and have synergies with people who are like-minded. Uh, sort of, yeah, like couch surfing, you could say, or like uh, co-working. Uh, depending on what you want, you can set the terms and conditions. Um, you can not only have the virtual interaction, but also physical meet other BitNation citizens. Um, and also more than 5,000 contracts and documents were uh, notarized on the websites that we built together with Estonia. Um, so for the geeks amongst you, we are using all of these technologies, Ethereum, Golang, IPFS, uh, React.js, Rootstock, and Secure Scuttlebot. And, um, yeah, basically, I mentioned this before, this Pantalasa mesh network that we are using for our app, it's, um, it's our own. We are not um, copying Secure Scuttlebutt or IPFS. We are using parts of their code, and we are building our own, um, let's say, encryption also on top of this, which should be quantum resistant, because most of the blockchains that we use today, uh, they can be broken by quantum computers, and we want to secure our citizens against this. Um, I think I can skip this. Um, so basically, what is all of this about? This is about being able to choose your own code of law that you want to use for uh, all the things that you do in your life. Now you're to use the French law, but um, you could possibly enter into a contract with someone pseudonymously on Pangea um, with common law, law or any other that you even can devise yourself. And the only thing matters is that it's that both parties are agreeing voluntarily to use this code of law um, so further you will have smart contracts that can be um, optimized and uh, that can be accessed even through emoticons in a chat interface so it should be very intuitive and even your grant should be able to use it from and um, further you can choose your arbitrators because in today's system you're forced to go to the court and to accept the judges that work there um, but you cannot, let's say, uh, select who will arbitrate your conflict based on their arbitration. So we will have a market of arbitrators, and uh, even if you don't like um, the specific offer of arbitrators that we have, we, we can also have third-party integrations like Crowd Jury that have a jury system based on um, based on the blockchain as well. So um, this is just the let's, let's say very infrastructure like the. Uh, government, first of all, needs to offer legal security to its citizens to protect their property, to give them, let's say, a um, stable um, yeah, framework to be able to, to live and to, to do uh, interactions. But uh, furthermore, we want to have um, a de-app market, so decentralized apps are de-apps, um, where people can develop their own apps on top of BitNation. And that could be about smart love, about marriage, about land titles, like I said before. It could be about birth certificates, peer-to-peer uh, -peer security. There's actually one uh, D-app that is already being developed called B Umbrella that will offer peer-to-peer -peer security and will also use BitNation for their ID and dispute resolution. Um, there could be like business and cooperation like in Estonia already, uh, basic income protocol, which uh, Johan Nygren is working on. Um, yeah, insurances, health insurance, unemployment insurance and so forth. Um, yeah, or even healthcare. Um, so we didn't come out of nowhere. We're not like uh, one of these many ICOs that just happened to come <laughs> out of uh, out of the woods. Now um, we were already there for more than three and a half years, I think. Um, Suzanne Tarkovsky Templehof founded us in 2014 and did many of the pilots. Let's say the the very proof of concept that this is possible. Like the first marriage on the blockchain, the first land property on the blockchain, the first uh, baby that was born on the blockchain. Um, and then we started the first iteration of Pangea in 2015. Uh, and we were trying to do it directly on the blockchain with Horizon, but we realized that this was very slow and it was not good for privacy because all the conversations would be public and this would not secure our citizens against government retaliation. Um, 
Then in 2015, we also had the refugee crisis and we were offering blockchain IDs to stateless refugees. Of course, um, nation state officials were not keen on accepting these, but still was like to show that it's possible to offer um, some sort of certification documentation for stateless people. And um, further in 2015, collaboration with Estonia for their e-residency program. And um, I think now both of us are much further and we should deepen our collaboration because uh, they also want to deeply root their uh, e-residency program in blockchain. And in 2016, we were trying to build up NG again through Secure Scalabot, but we realized it's not decentralized enough. And in the end of 2017, we made the decision to do an ICO, basically, and um, to use IPFS and to create the PET token. So the PET token, the Pangea arbitration token, is uh, being sold now in the end of March, uh, launching the public sale. The pre-sale is already finished, it was in the end of 2017. And it's there not only to, let's say, help um, BitNation, but also it's a utility. Like, it's a utility token that you can use for services, like um, to make agreements, to settle conflicts, to uh, create your nation. So for many things that you will do on Pangea, of course, it's uh, not mandatory, it's voluntary, but uh, you can use PET for all of these. And you can earn PET tokens by earning a good reputation on Pangea. So that's a po uh, positive uh, incentive. Also, for earning a good reputation, you will be able to earn these as well. Um, yeah, now uh, we're already further than the end of 2017, but uh, finally we're still working on the Lucy bot, which is an AI bot, because we know that reputation is very corruptible. As you can see, maybe in Black Mirror, there was this one episode about the reputation slavery. So we, we don't want to enforce this kind of uh, system where people rate each other. So um, we give out the reputation token through, uh, say, specific triggers that, that will be overseen by an uh, artificial intelligence. And um, I, I will go further into that later on. Um, so furthermore, I think it's, it's very interesting not only for individuals, but also even for tribes and nations that have no... Uh, legal backup or no, let's say, uh, sovereignty as of now. Like it could be a tribe in the rainforest, it could be like an unrecognized nation like Catalonia. So there's many parts of the world that um, do not have the sovereignty that they feel that they should have. And they could use the blockchain to reclaim their sovereignty. And um, further in the future, like now we're raising all these funds, I think it should be possible to offer. Uh, possible um, governance entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs to use these funds to um, make some proposals and basically here examples done through considerate so here you have people uh, voting on different projects and there could be an automized uh, connection to an ether fund where they will based on the voting get some funds but this is of course for smaller projects for bigger ones there would need to be consent also from the core team but I think it's a really cool idea to um, yeah, give uh, social entrepreneurs also a chance to kickstart their, their projects. Um, but this is more something for the future. Here were some um, yeah, uh, exemplary uh, embassies in the world. So we have um, embassies everywhere in the world. So uh, people in Barcelona, in Rio de Janeiro, in Bratislava. It could be uh, like some, some base, a hackerspace. Um, or it could be even your own living space, like here someone in Istanbul offered their space for refugees. Um, so finally I wanted to end this introduction with a quote by Suzanne tarkovsky tempelhof our founder. Um, she said, what we're doing is making nation-state governments entirely irrelevant. No government, whether democratic or autocratic, can survive without the consent of its subjects. In the same way Bitcoin has transformed the financial systems, BitNation will irreversibly change the political system and the course of history. So we have already been uh, covered by many media outlets. Uh, we've done, let's say, enough of um, marketing, uh, let's say, outreach in, in the past three and a half years. So now we are ready to, to really launch uh, the whole product development and the software so we can actually offer some tangible services to our citizens. And... Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, uh, 
please tell me about your questions and ideas. Okay. Uh, first, like, how do you, you mentioned something that you can choose the uh, jurisdiction. Mm. Uh, but how is that? Like, I mean, uh, because it's like you pick from some another country, or how it works? Like, for me. So basically, it's about creating your own jurisdictions, yeah, you, you which are independent from nation states. It's not. The it's not like uh, so you have to choose from. Supposed to be legal. Like you mean do it when doing a new contract? Yeah. So um, basically, there will be a market, let's say, of laws, uh -huh. and there will be also you can say a market of nations, which you can uh, participate in, you can join, and you can leave as well. So you can imagine this kind of like um, insurance companies, basically, yeah. where you just participate, you pay them some uh, contribution. Yeah. And um, you can, yeah, join and leave them whenever you want, and it's virtual. So it's not like you have to move from one place to another. Um, and it is not like the whole package of a government. It's like specific services that they offer. Okay. And um, further, these uh, nation builders will have the opportunity to create their own ERC-20 tokens, which means they can have like, a, a, let's say, local economy. They can represent their, their maybe... Um, local community, but maybe also global one. It could be a refugee nation, for example, for all the refugees in the world. It could be a gay nation, like giving legal services to all the uh, discriminated gay couples in the world. It could be um, the e Venezuela, like an uh, online alternative to the Venezuelan government. So uh, there, there's like lots of people already wanting to do these kind of things because um, they're either parts of minorities or um, it's, a, it's a yeah tribe or people that was not recognized, um, or it could be just a uh, popular culture, like, I don't know, it could be a hip-hop nation or whatever, so really, you can uh, identify with many m more things nowadays than with your geographical borders, because we already grew up in, a, let's say, a digital age, where even through memes, we start to identify with people all over the world, and so not just in our, let's say, local environment. Yeah, but I, I understand uh, the technology, but I don't understand how, like, in the practice, in reality, mm. for me, like, I think I'm Mexican, mm. and I do live in France. So, if yes, of course, if I want to, to print a birth certificate, I need to go back to France. Mm. And then, like, but here, like, to Mexico, sorry, and then, like, how it yeah. works there. Like, or if so, I of course, this is something, let's say, that happened in the past. This is more, like, for babies that are born now. Um, <laughs> So, for example, I think it was Suzanne's nephew, he was born and she just uh, made, um, let's say, a title or a certificate directly in this moment. Mm -hmm. So then you can prove, okay, this baby was born now. Um, but these are things where you have to talk, of course, with individual jurisdictions if they are uh, able or willing to actually move all of these records on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. But this is, of course, a much, much bigger effort than just initiating new interactions or things now and just as of the moment start a new web of trust of um, people who accept each other, recognize each other. Of course you don't have the big recognition like uh, now in France where you just have the millions of people who live under this jurisdiction but uh, we believe this will be a new international standard that transcends uh, national borders. Mm -hmm. Cause besides that, like, if you buy I don't know, like, a, a land title and then, like, how do you prove, or who is going to prove, like, yeah, we can, I can agree with someone, like, yeah, value hmm. this, so we put it in the blockchain, but who, like, maybe he's... Ah, uh, to verify the land. title, yeah. yes. He's like, this is my land, but who yeah. can verify that this of is course. actually his land? That hmm. maybe, because normally that's the government, the, uh, the notary. Yeah, yeah, notary. Yes. So, how do I trust him that he's... Yeah. he's so there could be two possible solutions for this. Um, either it could be done through experts, like it's being done today. So to have uh, like notaries that work specifically for this kind of uh, blockchain titles, or it could be, um, let's say, consensus. It could be like a local recognition by um, neighbors and other people who live in your area and who can back up your claim. So it could be done through witnesses. Um, I think we, we should just let the like people sort it out themselves, like to say what they like the best. So in general, standards um, should establish themselves, like through through market adoption, let's say. Mm -hmm. So we will see what people like the best if they want to have like some yeah experts who are just specialized, like uh, lawyers or something like this, or if they want to have let's say this uh, local consensus where just by having enough people back up their claim, it's already legitimate. Yeah. Like, Here is not a problem, but I see this in Mexico, and a lot of people are going to cheat. <laughs> mm, yeah, I can imagine. Country, 
Um, so we will see, we will see. Okay. Um, what do you think will make it work in the end? You say you can, you can create your own specific law. Hmm. Once there is a huge problem, people will refer to the law that's in France with the French law in the end. Hmm. So I don't know, I'm just thinking... How so it. first of all, all of these people will be pseudonymous. You will enter the app not um, saying I'm French, I'm Mexican, I'm so on and so forth. Um, everyone will be pseudonymous and you have no idea wh who they are and where, where they are. So uh, this already eliminates many of these problems because uh, you cannot sue them, you cannot, uh, you know, find them or something like this. And there's a really high degree of encryption involved. In this. So uh, the idea is really to give people the equal means to all of these services without uh, discriminating them based on where they happen to be born. And that also eliminates uh, potential racist behavior, for example, when you don't know who you're dealing with. Um, of course, you can add these things. These would be optional, and we will see in the future like what people want to do, let's say. Maybe it will be good for reputation. Uh, maybe people don't need it. It should be voluntary if they add things like uh, yeah, their information or not. Um, but in general, um, now it will be contracts for things that can be done digitally, um, money, for example, like uh, they, they will be paid through uh, Ether, or cryptocurrencies or tokens, and um, then make some agreements and um, the, the arbitrator will have to know, let's say, what is being done to be able to make a decision if it was right or wrong. But apart from that, all the things that are um, being fought about, let's say, in these agreements, uh, they will be digital. So I, I was already asked today, what about um, if I use a house as a collateral for a contract? So of course, when someone wants to take the house when the contract was not uh, fulfilled, uh, then you will know the identity of the other person. You need to be there physically. So that, of course, is, I don't know how that's going to be solved in the future. I think we will need uh, the nation state recognition of our laws then to be able to do these things. For the moment, it's mostly digital things that can be computed in smart contracts. Um, or, yeah, that can, could be done in a way that you don't have to give away your physical identity. Um, but I think that the, the sky is really the limit. It's, it depends on what people uh, want to have in it, when, what, how they uh, develop it, and everyone is encouraged to put their own apps and things on, on top of this, this uh, open source uh, movement. I think at some point it's maybe science fiction if you think that you have you gain enough traction, hmm. much much more than what you have. You have kind of bit nation citizenship, hmm. and everything that you gain from this citizenship values has much more value than what you will that you might lose if you don't respect the contract. Yeah, you see what I mean? It's like okay, we have a contract together. If I break it, I I can refer to the French law. Hmm. I, I will I will lose because I will get I will be discredited. I will, I will hmm. lose access to this to this whole community. Yeah, that's and that's. This loss will be higher than the, the gain of the contract. Hmm. So this could be also a solution. Yeah. So basically, it's it works like um, ostracization or how's it called? Like basically, when you're part of a network and um, when you disrespect the rules, you'll be blacklisted. Yes. And then you lose access to this potential market. And um, basically, it should be about the lost opportunities and not about the threat of force like you have today with the police. Um, so here, I can already um, take away, let's say, one of the most common questions about enforcement. So here, you don't have a police or military that enforces contracts through violence. Rather, um, you have a reputation system where, yeah, you have positive incentives because if you earn a good reputation, you will uh, be rewarded through pet tokens. But furthermore, um, having a bad reputation means you lose possible business opportunities. And um, basically, you uh, have also the escrow. You uh, could set up uh, things in a way that you need to give away a collateral in order to access, for example, a nation or when you should... Um, comply with the constitution or comply with certain uh, sets of laws, maybe you need to have some collateral and if you don't comply with these laws, you will lose the collateral. So it's really a game theory uh, game where it's about the, the costs and benefits. You need to calculate yourself what works the best. Yes? Hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah. Um, that's created, but we're also uh, building up a um, diplomatic ambassador network of um, people who should like represent us in front of the nation state officials and, for example, help citizens who are uh, in jail, for example, when, when they use BitNation documents. Like they should be able to help them with legal advice and we also want to build up a legal database of cases where um, we will have like an AI that can uh, access this database to, to help our citizens, let's say, automatically. Um, but also we, we should be able to like have a physical presence there to um, really, let's say, help uh, to bail out, for example, our, our citizens. Um, but it really depends on the case, let's say. Um, but I think it will be interesting to try out, for example, a BitNation passport and really like uh, cross the borders. And um, I mean, you should always have your, um, let's say, real uh, documents with you, just in case they um, like want to detain you. But in, in any case, if you already cross the border enough times with your uh, BitNation passport, I think it will already somehow establish itself. So I, I'm not the expert in this. We have uh, lawyers who have done this before. Uh, for example, for Liberland, you heard maybe about it. It's like this uh, new land between Serbia and Croatia. Um, and they're being detained all the time. They bring them out of jail. Like they literally bring them to jail and bring them out of jail again uh, whenever they cross the border to Liberland. Um, but I think it's, it's an interesting time where you can experiment with these new um, standards, let's say. And of course, until a standard is established, everything is rather shaky. But um, as soon as enough, as there's enough market adoption, it will just establish itself. Just like uh, governments establish themselves, like through having big enough populations, through having enough military, blah. Uh, in our case, it's not done through military, it's done through positive incentives. Any more <laughs> questions or critique? I mean, um, in general, I'd like to hear also about local problems, like here in Paris, for example, because ideally BitNation should not be like only for, uh, let's say, the whole world, or like it should be actually as well um, global and local at the same time, because we all face local problems and can use these to uh, solve problems somewhere else. So you, you always should start, let's say, with the local things and then come up with maybe a solution that can be um, universalized. So, uh, for example, Suzanne said in Amsterdam there was a big problem with trash collection. So we could think about a way to um, encourage, for example, tokenized trash collection. So whenever people pick up trash, they could earn some tokens. So you could think of ways how to solve, let's say, general uh, problems in the public and where you live and build an app for that together with BitNation. And to actually, we actually encourage everyone to become entrepreneurs in a way that is Pangea for BitNation, but like, uh, so the new application is through BitNation, not through Pangea? Through um, Pangea is the app, and BitNation is the organization behind it. Okay. Um, okay. And um, maybe in the future we'll have something else, but for now Pangea is really what we focus on. It's the legal infrastructure for all of these apps that will be built in the future, okay. and that will be used. <laughs> for the identification, for ID, for reputation. The whole reputation system is done through Pangea. Uh, but many more things like Be Umbrella, for, for example, or maybe for trash collection, or maybe for basic income, um, they will be built on top of this. Um, but by the way, um, all of these nations, they in the future should be able to also opt out from BitNation. Mm -hmm. So um, at some point, because all the code is uh, open source, fork and they could just make themselves independent from BitNation. Maybe in the beginning they would just need our help to do the smart contracts and so on. But in the future, for example, France could do a start a nation on BitNation and they could just then when they put it up, uh, opt out and they have their own uh, France token or whatever. So um, they, they, they can um, use our code whenever they want to and we actually encourage competition because we're opening up a new market that didn't exist before. Like, uh, we want to have competing <coughs> governance service providers so they are non-geographic. So I understand that you open a jurisdiction marketplace. How complicated it is to write my own jurisdiction? Hmm. For instance, for a non-tech guy. So, 
um, we give some advice, let's say, and we have also, let's say, some gu uh, guidance, what uh, laws you can choose from, what economic system you can choose from. Uh, of course, we offer the smart contracts. Um, in general, I think um, it will take some time in the beginning, and the end it will become more and more easier. And um, in general, like now we're doing this through Solidity, through uh, the, the programming language for the Ethereum blockchain. But in the future, it will also be hopefully possible to do it through JavaScript and so on when you have Lisp implementation. Um, so it will be more and more accessible for say, normal developers. And then at some point it should be so um, easy that also people who don't know, uh, who can't program at all can also start doing this. That you can just choose from specific, you know, like you have website builders and you can build websites without knowing the code. The same could be here. You can build nations and you can choose from different options and then like build it yourself. So yeah, um, I hope we will get there soon. Now it's more focused, let's say, on people who already know about this, uh, Bitcoin early adopters, crypto people. But at the end of this year, I think we will start to launch the beta. Like now it's the alpha release of the year. And then we when we have the beta release, it should be um, for a bigger market. And then it will be uh, like with the interface much more intuitive. Okay. And like you